Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is episode number 104 of Tech Sales Insights. Uh, as always, brought to you by Sales Community. Uh, for those that are members, thank you. For those that are not, you can go to salescommunity.com and you can do actually slash winter free uh, or look at the uh, website and you can uh, see a free link there. And uh, also have one of our sales community sponsors, Decision Link, as a sponsor uh, today. Uh, they are a very cool company in the value selling space. Uh, they're a customer value management platform, and they've got a really cool tagline, uh, Drive Value Further. Uh, the longer description is they are a uh, enablement platform that empowers companies to define, quantify, and validate business outcome at scale. From day one, draw a straight, straight line from your value proposition to revenue for your customers. Uh, and uh, so we have Bennett Cole, uh, CEO of NState. Uh, our topic is NFTs in the state of crypto. So uh, certainly a great time for it. And uh, as we were preparing, uh, I said, OK, here's, here's, here's the questions. Uh, I don't want the answers because I want to be surprised because I really don't get it. But I'm sure after this, I and our uh, listeners uh, will get it. And uh, for those uh, uh, watching along, uh, this is on LinkedIn Live, and uh, you can see us or you can hear us. We cannot see you, but certainly feel free to post any questions or any comments uh, along the way. And uh, we've got Tucker uh, behind the scenes, who always does a great job uh, getting those pulled up for us. So uh, Bennett uh, lives in the Boston area, West Roxbury. Uh, has a young family, uh, an eight eight month old, who uh, unfortunately Kate just uh, came home sick from uh, from daycare. So that, that's uh, certainly a bummer these days. And uh, he's also coached uh, grade school uh, baseball and basketball. And we are uh, both uh, investors in uh, SSC, which is kind of a BC centric uh, venture fund called was it S uh, Soaring Startup Circle, right? Right. There you go. Yeah, but certainly a great group there, too. And uh, needless to say, uh, Bennett's very active in the blockchain space and uh, somehow finds time to be a BC professor uh, teaching a course called Business Apps of Blockchain and Cryptocurrency, uh, of which uh, it sounds like the company's getting uh, too much of your time in the, the family. So you're you're done after uh, this semester, right? Yeah, so I usually only teach the fall semester and give okay. myself a breather in the spring. Gotcha. And then are you going to go do it next fall? Probably, yeah. There you go. All right. So uh, let's jump in here. So I always like to have people talk about their first job. And for you, it was uh, actually in sales at a Red Sox team store, right? Yeah, exactly. So I worked in the souvenir shop on Yawkey Way across from Fenway, um, you know, just sort of running merchandise from the back to the front. Um, you're checking people out at the cash register is sort of a, a typical retail job. But growing up as a lifelong Red Sox fan, especially one who grew up in New York, uh, it was really cool to go to Fenway for work and, you know, get to sneak into the games on breaks and, and just be around the stadium on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I, I grew up a diehard Yankees fan. I grew up in kind of New Haven, then Brantford, Connecticut, which was kind of the line for Yankees, yeah. Red Sox. And then with EMC, I kind of bounced around the world, laying it back in Boston, and then somehow became a Red Sox fan. So uh, anyway, very cool. And then maybe um, just kind of quickly go through your uh, career after uh, your uh, sales stint with the, at the Red Sox store. Yeah, so after that, I started working um, with my dad at his law firm. He's an IP attorney and started thinking about um, business development and ways we can get new clients into the practice. One of the ideas was uh, a website that categorized names, right? So things that people give names to, which are brands and, and you know, can turn into trademarks. One of the subcategories on the site was business names. And that became really popular as a way for people to make a claim to trademarks that they were using without actually registering them. So uh, we spun that out into its own business called Cognate. So I was the, the co-founder and CEO of that business um, starting in 2014 built that up um, into sort of a decent SaaS business. But then in 2015, we stumbled across this new thing called the Ethereum blockchain. So my CTO and I were at this talk at MIT, listening to this new database structure called the blockchain that can make these immutable timestamp records. We kind of looked at each other and said, you know, this is the perfect technology for helping people protect their trademark rights, whether or not they're registered. It's almost stronger 
than a registration. Of course, the lawyers wouldn't let us say this is stronger than an actual trademark registration, but we thought the tech was really cool, incorporated it into Cognate. Um, long story st short, we started doing some strategic partnerships with domain name registrars, eventually got connected to GoDaddy. GoDaddy bought Cognate in um, 2018. So uh, I spent a few years working at GoDaddy before leaving to co-found End State in 2021. Wow. Very, very cool. So 2015 is when you first got into all this. Yeah. So the very end of 2015 was when the first time we came across the term blockchain, did a little bit more research, um, started building out some of the infrastructure across 2016. And then the timing ended up being really good as it coincided with the first really major bull market in the crypto space where it entered mainstream consciousness. Wow. All right. So as we said before, I don't really get it. So I definitely look forward to being enlightened. So maybe kind of from a high level, set the stage, kind of from a basic perspective, describing crypto and describing blockchain. Sure. So crypto and blockchain are both umbrella terms and people use them sometimes interchangeably to refer to the industry that uses blockchains for various purposes. So a blockchain is just a form of a database that is typically a distributed ledger that has multiple participants who are all contributing to the consensus or really how new entries get added to the ledger, right? And so there's specific rules around the data that goes into the ledger. There's cryptographic security to make sure that people aren't cheating the system. And the whole blockchain ecosystem was developed to secure cryptocurrency, namely the first cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, right? So blockchain is an enabling technology that secures cryptocurrencies. And the first major use case for blockchains were these cryptocurrencies. I'm sure a lot of people followed the first ICO wave where all of these new tokens were coming into the market. People were saying you have to invest in crypto and buy you know, all these new tokens. It's the future, which you know, kind of turned out to be true and kind of turned out to not be true. But um, crypto, when people use it as a shorthand for cryptocurrency, is a subset of blockchain, right? So blockchain is the enabling technology that allows cryptocurrencies to function in this permissionless and distributed way. Got you. And then the relationship. So Bitcoin is kind of a subs is a crypt type of cryptocurrency. That's right. There's the first cryptocurrency. And are there other cryptocurrencies? Yes, there's now thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies. OK. And how do people mint or make you hear people say, hey, they've got their own Bitcoins and then they've got this almost mini data center in their house in order to make them. And it seems like unlimited that if you or I wanted to go mint or make our own Bitcoin, I just don't understand how that works. Each cryptocurrency has its own method for issuing new cryptocurrencies, how you acquire it. But let's just talk about Bitcoin to simplify things. Yeah. So. New Bitcoin is only created in one way, and it's by, quote unquote, mining Bitcoin. Yeah. But that's become a really professionalized process where people have these enormous data centers. They have access to cheap electricity. The most common way that people acquire Bitcoin now is to buy it on an exchange. So you go to something like Coinbase. You say, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin. Here's how much I want to buy. You buy it. They put it in a wallet for you. Um, in terms of issuing of new Bitcoin, it's not unlimited. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin ever minted. So it's a, a finite number. And it was part of the founding ethos behind the Bitcoin ecosystem is we want sound money, right? And it was sort of made in reaction to um, some of the quantitative easing policies that were put in place after the 2008 financial price crisis from the viewpoint of the creator or creators of Bitcoin, because they're still unknown who exactly it was. Um, from their point of view, you know, the banks got everyone into a lot of trouble and then the banks got bailed out and, you know, the government was de debasing the U.S. dollar. And there was, you know, sort of a whole um, ideological component that went into it. But one of the big um, pieces of it is there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin and it's deflationary. There is no Fed that can say, OK, we're going to, you know, Federal Reserve that can print more more Bitcoin. Gotcha. And from, a, again, naive perspective, it's kind of like, OK, I have this piece of paper. I'm going to call it a hundred dollar bill. All of a sudden it's worth one hundred dollars. So whoever had made or minted those Bitcoins early on, there is some cost. But then you have this yeah, pricing that then I know you kind of tra trades in a big, big range. 
um, but then it's kind of the market then that sets the pricing, correct? Yeah, that's right. So it is very volatile, right? It's not great for day-to-day -day transactions because if you use it to buy a cup of coffee, you know, you could spend $4 on your cup of coffee today and tomorrow you could have spent $400 on your cup of coffee or you could have spent four cents on it, right? I mean, swings aren't that dramatic anymore, but um, it is very volatile and it's become more of a, a store of value and an uncorrelated you know, an uncorrelated asset theoretically to the rest of the financial market. So people see it as more of a hedge um, and digital gold than a day-to-day -day transaction medium. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting for sure. So anyway, so let's jump into your company. So um, End State and uh, congratulations. You just did a uh, five and a half million dollar uh, seed round in June. Good timing on that, huh? Thank you. Yeah. Timing was, timing was very good. <laughs> wow. Awesome. And so um, if we talk about, I guess, kind of what you sell, there's three categories of physical sneakers, which I get, the NFTs, which I kind of don't get, and then these exclusive experiences that I don't get. So let's go kind of one by one. So physical sneakers, saw you did some cool shoes, sneakers for the uh, red bandana game. You have your Ortiz thing. Um, so maybe talk about that. Yeah, we actually think of them really all as one, right? So we don't think of it yeah. as two separate products. We like to think the digital component is the digital counterpart to the physical component and vice versa, right? Internally, we call it entangled. We like to think of it as, you know, these two things can't really be unentangled. They're, they're one entity. So starting from the easiest part, the part that's most familiar to everyone, we make physical sneakers. So we work with collaborators, think, athletes, artists, musicians, other brands who have followings, who want to connect with their followers in a, a more unique and engaging way. So we happen to do that through sneakers. <laughs> My co-founder is a woman named Stephanie Howard. She's a legendary sneaker designer. She was design director at New Balance. She was design director at Nike. Some of her designs that she did back in the 90s have been re-released in recent years because they were so popular. Um, so she has this really amazing following and great background in the space. So she, uh, you know, her, her collaborating with some of these athletes and artists is a big draw for them, just given her background in the space. So what we do is go to someone and say, hey, you know, we were big fans of yours. We think your audience would love a signature sneaker. Um, Stephanie designs an actual physical sneaker. We get it manufactured. And then we have a corresponding NFT that relates one to one to each pair of sneakers. Right. So you can think of it as a digital certificate of authenticity where you're saying this physical pair of sneakers is legitimate. And here is the digital certificate of authenticity as presented in the form of an NFT. And once we have those two things together, it then allows us to provide the third leg of the stool, which is these experiences exclusively for the fans of the collaborators who bought the sneaker, right? So we can have these token gated experiences where people um, are able to engage with the, the collaborator um, because they can prove that they bought the sneaker and they own the NFT showing that they're, you know, a big fan of the collaborator. So to take it from the abstract to a specific example, we recently did a sneaker with Devante Smith, who's a wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles, Heisman Trophy winner, incredibly talented, also happens to be a really fashionable guy. So we um, approached him to do a sneaker together. He was really excited about it. He and Stephanie went back and forth on a sneaker design landed on a design, started the production of the physical sneakers. Then we sold the NFT to the um, to, to Devante's fans. It sold out. And then we were able to layer in these experiences for his fans. Uh, the first one we did was um, almost like a, you know, almost like a, a parlay bet on, a, on an individual game where, um, or, or a prop bet, I should say, where if Devante had a play of 41 yards or longer, because that was how long his walk-off touchdown was in the 2019 National Championship at Alabama, we said if Devante has a play of 41 yards or longer, everyone who bought the NFT gets a cheesesteak, right? So we just airdropped, quote-unquote, airdropped a gift certificate to buy a cheesesteak to everyone who bought this NFT before the physical sneakers had even shipped. So it's this really cool engagement mechanism of Devante rewarding his loyal most loyal and closest fans who bought into the sneaker drop uh in a new and different way mediated through the nft uh and then we have a couple of other similar things to that with his on-field performance but then there's also in real life events so for instance in january we're doing an event at a sneaker boutique in philly Devante is going to be there and your ticket to the event is the sneaker so we've got a chip inside the sneaker you scan the sneaker 
you get to walk inside the door and come in and meet Devante because you bought his sneaker, right? So we really like this concept of um, connecting the collaborator to their fans through the NFT, through, you know, or super culturally relevant and interesting product being sneakers, uh, through an NFT as the sort of certificate of authenticity, which creates these unique experiences that you don't get through, you know, a, a traditional product offering. Gotcha. Fascinating. So uh, amazing. So those uh, watching, if you want to ask any questions or comment, please uh, feel free as uh, we go we go through this.